Today we begin our unit on Rome and first we're going to look at Rome's geography because it is very different from Greece's geography. Uh, Rome is located in Italy which is a peninsula. It had the Alps on the north that helped to separate it from the rest of Europe and because it had those very tall mountains it's protected but it's also not isolated like Greece is with its mountain range. Remember Greece was isolated into separate little poluses and so the mountains to the in, in the north of Italy are going to help protect it from invasion but it doesn't prevent them from uniting as a people. So they do have fertile plains, uh, they do develop around river valleys with the Po and the Tiber rivers and so there is a lot of agricultural surplus and that agricultural surplus is going to make it possible for Rome to develop. They do have access to the sea because they are a peninsula but they are safe from pirates and safe from raids and invasion that way as well because of their location. They do have a central location. Um, Italy is right smack in the middle of the Mediterranean and so it makes it a very good trading post for most of its early history. The very earliest settlers of the Italian peninsula are the Greeks and the Etrus Etruscans. And the Greeks, remember, were busy colonizing, so Italy is part of what they colonize. Um, so the Greeks are busy colonizing and they bring along their, their writing and art and cultural models that uh, later Romans will follow. The Etruscans were also there, and the Etruscans lived north of Rome in the mountain ranges. Um, among their accomplishments, they, they were settled down. They did have cities that were self-governing, that were fortified. So you can see the development of a civilization. They had a government with a king uh, who ruled with an aristocracy, which is like the nobility. And he had, an, had a council that advised him. As far as religion goes, um, they had their own religion, but they add the Greek religion to give their spirits human form, and then they would build temples to them as well, based on, the, on how the Greeks did it. Uh, about 400 BCE, the Gauls, which are a nomadic tribe of, of France, are going to force them to move on or to move south into Rome. And so that's how they're first going to encounter the Greeks and eventually the nomadic people that are living there. But anyway, that will give rise, that, that event gives rise to the legend of how Rome was founded. And this founding legend was about Romulus, who was the first king, and Remus, who is his brother. And we'll be doing some stuff in class to enhance your knowledge about Romulus and Remus. So the very first form of government in Rome is a Roman Republic. And the Roman Republic, um, this government form is, uh, a Republic means that the people have the power. And as Rome grows and adds more territory, it becomes actually a confederation. And a confederation is one where uh, you have several areas that are working together. So it's not, like they were joined as one, they don't they don't see themselves as one huge nation or one huge empire yet that's coming so but within the Roman Confederation you can see the different levels of how they treat people um, level one meant that you were a full Roman citizen that you were granted all the the rights and powers level two meant that you were able to uh, have contracts with or get married to level one citizens but you were not able to vote and you couldn't hold office Level three were the allies. They were uh, people that they had maybe defeated in battle or who had joined them in battle, and they were considered friends. Now, the interesting thing about the Roman Confederation is that during this time of, of allies and, and confederation, um, they did have an interesting policy with their soldiers and their foreign policy that defeated soldiers could join the Roman army. And it's kind of an idea that was taken from Alexander the Great. Remember, he has, he thought, you know, that made more sense to get them to join the army. Uh, rather than kill them all, it, it helps to boost your numbers. And it's good for foreign policy. Other countries are going to be more willing to work with you if they know that they're not going to be completely annihilated. Well, within this confederation, you did have executive officers that were Roman, and these are the people who are in charge. And you had two consuls. Consuls were men who led the army, and they could only serve for one term, but their duties were to work with the military and to protect Rome. So you had one consul whose chief duty was to um, 
protect Rome and the other whose I whose idea was to protect the the Empire or the land of Rome and then you had the Praetor and the Praetor stayed in Rome to govern the city So it's kind of like having a mayor So you had the consul who's in charge of protecting Rome You had the consul who's in charge of protecting Rome the land of Rome And then you had the Praetor who was kind of like the mayor of the city so these are the people that are in charge. And eventually the Romans are going to develop into certain social groups. Uh, you will have the patricians who were the wealthy landowners. Um, typically they were your nobility. They were the elite class. They were at the very top of the, of the food chain. They had the power to veto laws, which means that they could reject laws. So they had a lot of political power. They also participated in something called clientage. And clientage was where you would take on someone who was less fortunate than you, less rich than you, and kind of teach them the ropes. So you would pick somebody that you saw a lot of potential in, that maybe they're very intelligent or that they had um, some star power or whatever, that they, they, they grabbed people's attention. And so you would uh, take them on as your clientage and teach them how to become a politician, how to use their power correctly or wisely. So that's the patrician class. Then you also have the plebeian class, and the plebeian class had no power, no money. They were your farmers, your artisans, your merchants, basically the commoners. Um, and so they make several attempts to try and gain some power because there's more of the plebeians than there are of the patricians but um, they very seldom get any power. Until 494 BCE, when they decide to um, make a big statement, what they're going to do is they're gonna withdraw from the state, because basically they're gonna say, the state doesn't represent us, it represents the patricians. However, it's the plebeians that are the ones fighting in the wars all the time. And they felt that wasn't fair, so they're gonna refuse to fight in the wars if they're not given some political rights. As a result, the patricians realize that they're going to have to give in something because otherwise they will have no military. And if they have no military, they're not going to have any power. So they create the Council of Plebes. And the Council of Plebes is created to give the plebeians a vote in government. Um, it can make and propose laws. And so it one of the things that it proposes is the laws of the 12 tables. And the 12 tables are basically these 12 tone 12 stone tablets with laws that are going to be etched into them and posted in the marketplaces. And the plebeians um, wanted this because they basically had asked, you know, how can we know the law if the law isn't written down? And it's the first time that plebeians could see the law and actually appeal a ver verdict because they now knew what the law was. They could point to it and say, here it is in stone, literally etched in stone, the law. And so you can't charge me with this or you can't do this. And so um, they continued to work for the plebeians by proposing laws. And eventually by 287, um, all of the citizens of Rome will be considered equal under under law, not just those that were of that level one of first for of full citizenship. So it's a good thing that they were able to pull that sort of together because they are going to need to have their military when the Punic Wars break out. And the Punic Wars are fought between Rome and the Phoenicians. And the Phoenicians are a civilization in northern Africa. They're across the Mediterranean Sea. And so it's going to be Rome, the city, taking on their capital city of Carthage. Now, Rome has the better army, but Carthage has the better navy. And so it is kind of an interesting uh, dilemma that Rome finds itself in. The issue of the first Punic War is going to be the island of Sicily. Uh, both Rome and Carthage wanted access to this because it is a good stopping point uh, for trade. Rome wins. So then that brings along a second Punic War, and the Senate, second Punic War is also fought between Rome and Carthage. And this time the issue is Spain. Now Carthage, the Phoenicians had been making um, small uh, col colonies in Spain, and the Romans didn't, Romans didn't like that. They, they thought that that was their territory, so that was a big issue as well. So uh, the Phoenicians get a new leader, new military commander, and his name is Hannibal. And Hannibal is going to make the decision to take the war to Rome, um, that he is going to actually go march on Rome and take it over. Now the Romans are near defeat, 
um, because Hannibal is such a good leader. But Hannibal lacks men and he lacks equipment. But the Romans are going to expect an attack from the south because it makes more sense that he would attack from the so southern area rather than going north through the Alps. And so um, they're unprepared and this, this fight is going to take 15 years. Rome eventually takes over Spain and then goes off to attack Carthage because they're just like, enough's enough, we need to, to teach him a lesson. And so that forces Hannibal to return home to protect his home city. And then the Battle of Zama takes place and Rome wins. Again, um, the next Punic War, or the Third Punic War, is again Rome versus Carthage. And Rome is just sick and tired of having to deal with these people, and so they are going to completely destroy Carthage. Um, they completely destroy the city, they take all the people that they capture and sell them off as slaves, um, they burn their city, and they put salt on the land. And the reason they put salt on the land is to make it so that nothing can grow there again, and um, to send the message that you will not thrive in this place. So eventually we get um, further expansion of the Romans. They begin to expand into Macedonia and Greece and parts of Mesopotamia. Rome's justification for all this is that they are doing it as a defensive strategy, that if we don't attack them first, they're going to be attacking us. So we are doing it defensively and we are gaining allies. As they expand, they have more and more military commands, they have more and more money, and they have more and more slaves. They then become increasingly arrogant about their power and brutal. And so we're going to see sort of a change in the Romans that they're not quite so nice as they used to be. There's also some internal instability because the government isn't keeping up. Um, the power of the Senate is going to be a huge issue. The Senate was made up of uh, 500 uh, individuals and these 500 individuals about half of them are senators from just 10 families so these 10 families had a ton of power and that's not always the best best policy um, they had a lot of wealth they had a lot of clientage they had a lot of intimidation that helped to get them to that position but what it's going to do is create a division in the Senate and you're going to have the optimates versus the popularis. And the optimates are the best men. They're from, those are those 50% or half of them that are from those 10 families. And so it's all based on money and power and family blood, that who you are related to. The other half are the popularis, and these are the other senators, the ones that don't belong to those 10 families. And they tend to get the support of the people or the poor because that's who they tend to side with. Now the issues that are coming up behind this include um, small farmers are very concerned about the power of the senators because of land ownership. That if you own land, you are a citizen, so then you have to serve as a soldier. And that military term is for six years. Well, you can't be away from your farm for six years because your land deteriorates. Um, and if you don't have children to watch it for you or to take care of it or family to take care of it, it goes to seed. It doesn't, doesn't do well. And so they tended to have to sell. And typically who they're selling to are those the optimates, those very powerful families. And so this creates latifundia, and latifundia are aristocratic estates that are created from the powerful buying up all this land. And so you get, um, they had to purchase slaves in order to work it because you have such a large amount of land. You have tenant farmers, um, cash crops for money, um, but the problem is that now less people own land and so you have less people to actually be in your military and because now they're working for you as a, as a job rather than owning the land themselves you're gonna have a decline in your in your army and that's going to cause a problem and so we're gonna see a series of reformers in the next video of who's gonna try and change this to make things better in Rome